Hello there ladies and gentlemen, TX141 here, also known as Paul, bringing you another Ace in a Day gameplay for the Arcade Motor War Thunder. In today's instalment I shall be reviewing the F4U1C Corsair. To give you a small historical overview on the 1C variant, as I've already provided a historical overview of the Corsair in general, which you may see using the link in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now, the 1C variant was developed in parallel with the 1D variant over the course of 1943. The idea was to equip the plane with the same upgrades as the 1D, but switch out the 650 caliber machine gun ar armament for four 20mm AN-M2 Hispano cannons. The idea in doing this was to convert the Corsair from pure fighter to fighter slash ground attacker, with the cannons up in the armament in this regard. Additionally, the ability to mount underwing pylons in order to equip rockets and bombs would mean that the Corsair would be an effective ground attack fighter. The result saw the 1C into its first test flights as of August 1943, and the plane only saw 200 variants produced over the course of 1944, between July and November of that year. Favour was given to the 1D variant, and as the 1C variant saw operational service as part of the Battle of Okinawa between April and June of 1945, the reasons for this were highlighted quite clearly. The addition of the 20mm armament meant that the plane was heavier, and as a result less manoeuvrable. Moreover, pilots found that while the cannons were effective, they were unnecessary because Japanese planes had a lot less armour, and as a result 650 cows were quite adequate. As a result, the 1C goes down in history as the rather neglected variant of the Corsair, seeing very little service, and indeed service only towards the end of the war in the Pacific. With that being said, how does the F4U 1C handle in War Thunder? Well, over the course of this ground strike gameplay on the map gorge, I'm going to show you what happens exactly when you put an F4U-1C into a very advantage, uh, advantageous situation. To send on the Shiak 9T to achieve our second kill, we reflect that our setup is as follows. Stealth ammunition in our cannons, a 500m gun convergence and a 30 minute fuel load. This is a setup that echoes that which I've used on the two previous iterations of the Corsair, minus the fact we now have cannons rather than machine guns. The stealth ammunition allows us to catch opponents by surprise when we dive on them. And additionally, whenever we go head to head, as you're going to see over the course of a number of times during this game, our opponents will not know when our bullets are going towards them. Additionally, the 500m gun convergence allows for a significant amount of spread at all ranges. As we break around on the, to this KI-61 high, we dodge the most of their fire, and additionally, we come around due to the speed we gained from that split test manoeuvre we performed before going for the head-on. And over the course of a number of small rather turns, we gain the advantage and start to come up behind the KI 61A, which is quite a nose heavy play. As we break around and begin to break up in order to get the kill, a friendly Yak 9K comes over to finish them off, meaning that we're only limited to two kills thus far and we assisted in that regard. Leveling out to pick up our speed, we are confronted with a dilemma. An enemy year 2 has arrived the second of which in the game we've seen so far. Do we go for them, or do we go for someone else? Very quickly the decision is made for us by an enemy I-185 that comes directly towards us, as you're going to see. And this is where the 1C is different from the 1D and 1A variants, in the fact that while it mimics the durability of the two, the armament gives it that leading edge. As we open fire, we take only a glancing hit from the 20 mils of the I-185, additionally doing a small bit of damage in return. As we both break off, Myself using the Corsair's dive speed and speed on the level in order to get away, the I-185 breaks off in favour of other friendly targets, and so we're free to roam the skies a little bit more, trying to find a new target. This soon comes in the favour of a Spitfire, which we see on the horizon, although the Spitfire is merely drifting towards higher altitudes and is not a top priority, despite the fact that I gradually proceed over towards them. Keep an eye on my sides and behind me in case any other enemy fighters try to come to higher altitudes. Indeed, the 1C maintains the overall maneuverability at high speed of the 1D. It's a plane which handles well at 400 kilometers an hour more, but please remember at 600 kilometers an hour more, your roll rate and your control surfaces begin to stiffen quite a bit, or lock up as I usually call it. 
Take this plane below 300 km an hour and it will die very quickly, simply because it does not have the maneuverability at those speeds in order to try and turn with an opponent. However, because this plane speed because this plane picks up so much speed in the dive, and additionally picks up speed quite well on the level, it means that an energy capacity is the best suited for the F4U1C. And as we know, a Messerschmitt 110 C4 gliding towards friendly territory, we decide to descend upon them and take them out. Opening fire at significant distance, as we're going to see, even a very durable plane can take a lot of damage. Breaking off, having achieved a significant critical and damaged the whole left hand side of the Messerschmitt 110 C4, we reload our cannons, which we've jammed, and consider passing back around. Unfortunately, I break around a little bit too early in order to take another shot, simply because my cannons are still reloading, and this was a mistake on my part. However, that BF 110 C4 gradually descends to become our fourth kill, I believe. Breaking around, we see an A6M3. Raisin coming towards us, and we begin to note that our confidence increases over the course of the game as we start to realise how many planes we can go head to head with and obviously try and manoeuvre out of the way of their incoming fire, but we're able to soak up the majority of the fire due to our durability, whereas the A6M3 cannot. Opening fire at 0.8 kilometres, we take off their wing while they only glance us with their cannons, and we proceed ahead with our third kill in the bag and look for another opponent to pick on. And this opponent rears its head very soon. So really, you're probably asking the question right now, was the Corsair good for anything other than head-ons? Well, yes. As I said, it's very good in the boom and zoom capacity, simply because it's a very energetic plane, and highly manoeuvrable with speed. However, because you've got these extra cannons, it means that you can always throw caution to the wind in some situations, and go for that head-on, whereas the other Corsair variants could go head-on, but probably wouldn't do the damage with the 650 cows. As we note an enemy Yak-3 coming up towards us, our altitude advantage and indeed our overall speed means that we can continue to climb and cause them to bleed even more speed before descending upon them. Keep an eye on our target and noting our fourth kill has just arrived in the form of that Messerschmitt 110 from earlier, we now begin to descend on this Yak-3, who's less than energetic. Indeed, as they try and break round in order to dodge our fire, we're able to take our time and pick our shots accordingly. taking them apart in order to achieve our ace. We then see a Junkers 88 who's come fresh out of spawn but has had ample time in order to dive. And while I discourage spawn killing, if an enemy bomber does not dive as soon as they come out of the spawn, when I'm quite close to the spawn, I will go for them, meaning that I achieve my sixth kill quite quickly. So at this point I'm looking around for any enemy foes that could be up at the same altitude as myself before essentially hammerheading round, and I notice an enemy A6M2 Raisin coming towards us. Zeroing in on the target, we notice that they want to go for another head-on, with a very small amount of energy left to boot as they're stalling out. Having opened fire at 1.2 km, the majority of our armament misses, simply because we compromise our aim way too much, aiming way too high. However, it's at this point that we zoom climb upwards, and come around again for another shot on the A6M2. And as they're gradually stalling out, and have a lacklustre of energy, we can make this pass count as the A6M2 begins to raise their nose and then stall out. With 7 kills in the bag, we now begin to level out, and we see an MA5 coming directly towards us. However, this time we're well prepared. Opening fire at 1.3 kilometers, our cannon rounds make their mark and take out the LA5, achieving us our 8th kill. And really it's all about dominating at the higher altitudes at this point. Of course, this gameplay is one of two halves, while I do not have a second gameplay to show here simply because this gameplay I feel showcases what can happen when the Corsair is in a dominating position, but also in a position where it does go up against foes which are on the same level altitude as it, you have to be aware that at your battle rating of 4.7 you will go up against planes such as the Focke-Wulf 190D9, the F8F Bearcat, the P51D Mustang and the Messerschmitt 109 Gustav II. These are all planes which can outclimb you significantly. And speaking of climbing, a Messerschmitt 109 F variant comes directly towards us. But in our head on, we open fire at 1.2 kilometers and kill their pilot before the F1 can even retaliate. We resume on our point by noting that when we're up against the more energetic planes, which can climb with us if not outclimb us, you will have to resort to the same tactics I used in my 1D review hanging out on the fringes of the map and descending upon foes when and where appropriate, using high speed boom and zoom runs in order to make your shots count. You'll have to be patient 
Over the course of this game I was rather patient in some of the targets I picked, with a lot of my targets actually coming for me rather than me selecting them. This bow fighter being one that I selected, noting that I had very little energy to boot, allowed us to achieve our 10th kill, making this a double ace. We then see a cow 61 gradually coming towards us from behind, and despite the fact that we have a lot of speed and therefore are still gaining the distance, I very shortly after reloading decide to come around and engage them, engaging via my standard manoeuvre of a split S to make sure my speed is high. Of course we could just carry on running away, but I know the cow 61 is going to follow me to the edge of the map, and I'm not one for abusing the whole edge of map teleport respawn. As a result, the cannons reloaded, it's time to break ground. Using the split S in order to build up our speed, we then go for the head on. With KR61 having very little armour, and opening fire at 0.75km, we're able to get our 11th kill and dodge all the incoming fire. A, Mesh a Messerschmitt 109 Emil then comes directly foot towards us. And while we achieve a couple of hits and a critical on them, our initial head on burst is not enough, and we manage to dodge the main amount of their fire, taking a small hit from their machine guns. It's at this point that I continue to break away, due to my brilliant speed on the level. And as you're going to see, the Emil has to use pretty much all their war emergency power in order to keep up. As we begin to head towards 500 km an hour speed at an altitude of 3,500 meters. It's at this point that we reflect on how well the plane performs with altitude. The plane is pretty consistent, although I recommend flying somewhere between 3,000 to 6,000 meters in order to get the most out of the speed and the overall performance of the plane. At 2,000 meters, or less, you'll start to notice that your top speed is harder to obtain, and at very high altitudes, i.e. 6000 meters plus, you'll notice that the plane starts to become a bit sluggish in its handling. As a result, if you can stay between 3000 or 6000 meters, whilst at the same time trying not to drop anywhere below 2500, unless you're escaping from a boom and zoom pass, the plane will handle it its best, in addition to a speed of 400 kilometers an hour to 600 kilometers an hour, allowing you to get the most out of the plane. We continue to pull our distance on the Messerschmitt 109, and I like to pull a 2km gap, if not more, before coming around on the split S, or indeed a, a wide arc turn. Of course, I punctuate my wide arc turns by using the rudder to bring the nose down, as that will allow me to build up a little bit more speed, or conserve as much energy as possible, rather than lose it all by performing a wide sweeping arc. That's the thing to know. Every time you can bring the nose down for a little bit more, the additional weight of the armament, and indeed the, the oversized engine in the nose, will mean that you pick up a little bit more speed, or conserve some more energy, whereby opponents may not. I keep checking behind and with that mountain close by, I decide to leave doing a complete split, split test to avoid hitting the mountain. And again here, I use the rudder to bring the nose down and bring me around faster. We go into another head-on, and this time I open fire at one kilometer, achieving a nice hit on the 109's rudder, which means that they have no control of the plane anymore and are gradually descending towards the ground. I loop around anyway in order to take another shot if needed. However the 109 has gone for now, and this is our 12th kill, just waiting to hit the ground. Leveling out, we have achieved high altitude supremacy over the course of these 12 kills. We no longer have a foe who is going to come up towards the same altitude as us, because really we are a fighter's nightmare at this point. Leveling out we see a P3 in the distance, but they're already being harassed by a friendly P63 King Cobra. And as I type into the chat, right, time for a coffee break, or tea break, ugh, I hate coffee. It's worth noting that every head-on I've had during the course of this game has been up against foes which have been armed with quite adequate armament. Whether it's been cannons, or a mixture of machine guns and cannons, every time we've been up against foes who have been able to try and put us down. However, because of our durability, and our overall impressive armament, we've been able to clinch the shots when and when necessary. And at the same time, if needed, absorb the damage, whereas our opponents cannot absorb as much damage as us. This means that the F4U1C, if necessary, can go head to head with quite some with some quite drastic opponents. And I have a num I have had a number of situations where I've gone head to head with fuck all for 90A fires to give them as good as they can give me. However, Going head to head with, su with a foe that's got as much armament as you is not always necessary. Indeed, sometimes you can just run away from the foe. Yet, that is a story for another time. We see an enemy P3 continue to climb up towards higher altitudes, but I'm already aware that our P63's got the situation under control. When an enemy A6M30 gradually climbing up, 
they begin to turn away and head back towards lower altitude as we make our way over towards the enemy spawn point. Of course, trying to avoid spawn killing when necessary. I begin to know that the enemy team is refraining from climbing anymore. And I'm getting rather worried about the enemy AA hitting me, having achieved 12 kills, and knowing that I've got to go on to my 13th kill very shortly. So at this point I noticed an enemy Dornier 217J climbing up. However, they're bleeding energy quite quickly and they're still over their airfield, meaning I can only keep them under surveillance for now, just because I'm rather worried. Because I just have a bad feeling about this one. I level out and just keep my eyes on them, because as soon as they break away from the airfield, I know I'm going to dive on them. And with the Dornier now breaking away from the airfield, it's time for me to descend and try and take them out. And this is the final point to note about the F4U1C. While the cannons are lethal, sometimes they just won't make their mark. Despite the fact that we open fire from a very long distance and try to put our shots in accordingly. We take out the tail control of the Dornier 217J1, but it's just not enough to secure that 13th kill by the end of the game. As you're going to see. So I'm afraid we have to sit with 12 kills which is still, in my opinion, a rather impressive haul for a plane which has become very competitive. As we fly off, it's time to reflect on some post-game stats. So, we reflect upon this gameplay by noting that our 12 kills netted us 41,918 silver lines. Additionally, we earned 2,411 research points, with all of those going towards our research on the F-82E Twin Mustang. We conclude this review by noting that the 1C has a number of similarities to the 1D, possessing excessive durability, brilliant dive speed, decent level speed, and a good climb rate. Additionally, your maneuverability comes at high speed, i.e. 400 kilometers an hour or more. However, the differences are in terms of the armament. By switching out the armament for 420mm cannons, you instantly upgrade the plane into a plane which can face a lot of foes without fear, either via head-ons or via a series of energy tactics or boom and zoom dives. Maneuvers such as the split S will allow you to maintain your speed, although never be afraid to run away, despite the fact you have a brimming armament. Additionally, the cannons should not lead to you becoming overconfident. During the course of this gameplay, I did go head-to-head -head with a number of foes without any significant rarefactions or problems. However, there will be foes such as the Focke-Wulf on 90A5, which have an armament similar, if not more potent than yours, and can do just as much damage to you. And I would engage these opponents at your own risk. Moreover, this gameplay has also shown one side of the 1C. I went up against a lot of foes with comparable battle ratings, but not superior to my own. And if I had gone up against planes such as Focke-Wulf on 90D9s, Messerschmitt 109 G2s, or even F8F Bearcats, this plane switches to a fringe raker, whereby you hang out on the fringes of the map, and then perform small boom and zoom passes before diving away to safety, where appropriate, in order to rack up your kills and assists over a large period of time. We're now going to take a look at our performance by comparison with our team, and we see that we came first, by a significant margin, because we controlled the higher altitudes of the map, and made sure that no bomber or fighter could make its way to target. With that being said, if you're looking for a Corsair that's rewarding as the final part of your grind, and one that is armed to the teeth with cannons, and has a durability to match, then the F4U1C is the variant for you. And that concludes my week of Corsair reviews, ladies and gentlemen, and now I'm going to take a couple of days off to recuperate after what has been quite an interesting and enjoyable series of reviews. With that being said, I've been TX141, and if you've enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, Comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, take care and good luck in the skies.